Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so how many people know what World Food Program is? So, okay, a little bit, all right. Um, World Food Program is the largest humanitarian agency of the UN system. And um, each year, we reach about 80 million people uh, around the world in about 80 countries. Uh, and we provide food assistance, basically. We are also a voluntarily funded uh, organization. And last year, our uh, intake was about $5.9 billion. So just to, just to put that in, in perspective. Now, <coughs> this year, um, one thing I'm sure, I mean, you've, you've heard a lot about uh, famines in the four countries um, and uh, for us we, we, we are since we are in the field we see all of these things firsthand so one of the questions and this is why the title uh, you know famines in 21st century why what's the what's the story because if you can understand the the story then you can address it also better right so this pre presentation is, has uh, essentially two parts. In one part, the first part, we talk about what is the global food security situation in the world. Why are we in a state of famine in, uh, or near famine in, in four countries? And broadly speaking, what would it take to address the global food security conditions? So in 21st century, by 2030, as the SDGs say, we have a world free of hunger. What would that take, right? So that's that's really what I wanted to present. And on that side, uh, what is the role of technology? How does technology make us work more better and in a more efficient uh, way? Now, okay. This is just the situation. Seven billion people in the world. Two billion people don't have enough to don't have enough to eat in terms of nutritious food, right? Almost 800 million people are chronically f hungry. Chronically hungry means their hunger is part of their life. Every day they're hungry, and there are about 108 million people in the world who are what we call acutely malnourished or suffering. And they are suffering because of um, causes like war, um, droughts, bad weather, flooding, things like that. So this is our world. And if we want to reach a zero hunger world, we have to sort out all of this. right? And we put a date and a time on this because we said in, through the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, that by 2030 there shouldn't be any hungry person in the, in the world. Break it down, those numbers, you got about 21,000 people every day dying because of hun hunger-related causes. And a third of those deaths are five-year-olds or below five-year-olds. This is the situation today. 2017, we are saying that there are 108 million, as you saw that number, 108 million people who are acutely in a bad state. The, if you compare this number to last year, it is 35% higher. Last year we had 80 million people, this year we have 108 million people. So 35% more people are acutely malnourished today compared to even last year. So we are going the wrong way in a way, you know. And uh, when you look at the four famine countries, or where w countries where people are on the verge of a famine, uh, which is northern Ni northeast Nigeria, South Sudan, Yemen, and Somalia, combined, of those 108 million people I talked about, 30 million are in these countries. These only in th these four four countries. And. Uh, by the way, the, the numbers which you see here, they are uh, 
let's call them consensus-based numbers, which are put together uh, by a team of experts from 12 different agencies which work in food security analysis. It is called the IPC, Integrated Phase Classification. So there is consensus in terms of the, the validity of these numbers, if I can put it that way. Okay. So you say, why? Of the 13 biggest food security crises in the world right now, 10 are purely conflict. Okay. The remaining are either a combination of weather shocks and conflict or just weather shocks. Like last year, you, you know, El Nino and its impact in, uh, in uh, East Africa and Southern Africa was, was all, over the, all over the place. Two other things are important here. One, that most of the people who are affected, they're rural populations, they're rural people for whom agriculture is lifeline. And two, that the conflicts with which we are dealing with, they are uh, not one year or two years, they have been sustained for quite some time. So even our shortest conflict, if you will, which is Yemen, just entered its third year. If you look at Syria, has entered into its seventh year, right? And with Syria, the, so, so just to put this again into perspective, a child who was six years old is a teenager now, and all they have seen is a conflict. A kid who was 11 years old is 18 year old now, and all they have seen is conflict, right? So this continuation has a terrible effect not only on the people today, but forward, going forward, the next generation. But also what it does is that it minimizes or totally decimates your ability to cope with these difficulties with your own resources. So conflict in rural populations. And in rural populations, uh, conflict affects both the supply side as well as the demand side. What do I mean by that? People generally in rural areas will grow their food. When there is conflict, they cannot grow their food. That simple, right? They rely on livestock. When there is conflict, you cannot move your livestock to the water points or to the pasture lands and all of that. So livestock doesn't work. For income, they rely on agricultural labor. If agriculture is not working, there are no agricultural labor opportunities either. So there is no income. Combined effect, you have no purchasing power. People in living in conflicts in places like Northeast Nigeria or South Sudan, they, their, their purchasing power gets totally uh, decimated. The same conflict also affects markets and prices. Because, because of the conflict, either the markets not, don't work or if they work, the prices are too high. Why? Because people have to pay the risk premium for bringing commodities into an into a affected area. So people living there, they get squeezed because they don't have purchasing power, and they get squeezed because the prices are too high, so they cannot afford it. Now what do they do? Those who can leave, they leave. And this is why the displacements matter. Like if, again, in northeast Nigeria, uh, in the Borno state, which is northeast, a million people show up in the capital of northeast Nigeria, which is Maiduguri, right? Or right now, if you look into South Sudan, there's a huge refugee influx into, uh, into Uganda because they know that they, that's, that's the only place they can, they, they can have some kind of a livelihood. But it gets even worse. And the worst part is that not everybody who's suffering can leave, right? So you have pockets of people who are stuck. So no money, no food, no living essentials, and no ability to get out. That's what the famines are all about. Physical and economic access to livelihood essentials, including food, is absolutely disrupted. So what must happen? 
First of all, very simple, stop the wars. Because if you stop the wars, people can go back and start to rebuild their lives. But we all know uh, that's not happening, or not happening fast enough. So in the meantime, you need two things. First is humanitarian access, unimpeded, sustained humanitarian access. You must be able to reach people in those places which I talked about with what they need, the essential commodities that they need. And, and, and it cannot be one month or one day. It has to be a sustained every month access. That's number one. In order to do that, you need big money and you need timely money, right? If we have both of these things, we can avert famines. If we have only money, the cost of doing business is 10 times higher than that. What do I mean by that? If you're taking, if you're doing airdrops in South Sudan, for example, it will cost you seven to 10 times more than taking stuff by a truck, right? And in this climate where there is not enough money and there's such huge numbers are in fact going up, that money must, has to cover more. So humanitarian access, where we can go by road in the cheapest way and deliver, not only saves the lives of the people we are saving today, but it gives us additional resources to save other lives in other places. And that's why humanitarian access matters. And that's why adequate funding matters. And when that doesn't happen, we get into famine. For me, famine is not a state of assessment. It is a state of, out, it is an outcome. And it is an acknowledgement of a collective failure. And why is that? Because technically, when we say that there is a famine, we are saying that three conditions must come together. The first one, food shortages. In any, it could be a district, it could be a county, it could be a state, it could be a country. What we need to prove to call it a famine is that 20% of the population in that particular geographic unit must be starving. We also have to say that 30% people in the same geographic, uh, of 30% uh, of children under five in the same geographic unit must be acutely malnourished. And then the third one is that the death rate, the mortality rate, should be twice the average rate, right? Which is two, more than two per 10,000 per day. Now bear with me for one second. This graph, who knows about the Somalia uh, 2011 famine? There was a big, the last famine, the last recorded famine was in 2011 in Somalia. And John Hopkins uh, did a study, I think in 2013, and uh, they estimated that 260,000 people died in that famine, okay? And that famine was declared in July of 2011. If you look at, this is the excess mortality, right? So you can see that more than half of those 260,000 people who died, who died, they died before July 2011. Hence, if you're dead, I mean, you know, uh, this is, we cannot feed the dead, right? Okay. Can you imagine that this is even worse than that? The, the acute malnutrition part? Our literature, our medical science tells us that if we don't, uh, if the, the first 1,000 days from conception to the second birthday, I guess, if the child is not nourished well enough, they never recover from that for their entire life in terms of their productivity. 
So to say that there is a famine, essentially what you're saying is that 30% of the children in the community will never reach their productive, their, their full potential, right? How strong is that? This is why it is an acknowledgement of collective failure. Because we must do everything to save the next generation, and we must do everything to sure, make sure that people don't die of hunger or hunger-related causes today. And this, this is why famine is the F word in the humanitarian world. Because you never want to get there. But unfortunately, this year, we are talking about similar situations in four countries. Not one, four. Okay. Let's change. So that's the cute part. This is about why does why are we still talking about hunger, guys? 21st century, wh wh what's wrong? I mean, we can go to the moon, we can go up, we can do all of that, but people still die of because they don't have enough food to eat. So you look at it from as a, as an economist and say, okay, let's look at it. Is it a production problem because we just don't produce enough, so we don't have enough, or is it a bad economics that it doesn't make sense to feed people? Okay, let's find out. On the production side, every year we produce 4 billion tons of food. Of that, a third is wasted. And you know what, what's funny? Is that this one third food which is wasted, it is the same in the developed world and in the developing world. The difference is that in the developed world, we, wa we waste food on the plate. In the developing world, we waste food before it comes to the plate. And the reason is the same, economic valuation. Us here, we spend less than 10% of our income on food. So if some, you know, you food goes waste in the, in the, you know, rots in the fridge or something, it's no big deal, right? A person in the developing country may spend as much as 75% of their income on food. So it's a no-no to waste your food, right? Now, you could say, I mean, growing up, I, I heard this, I mean, uh, you know, don't, don't leave stuff on your plate because people are dying in pick a place, right? And the sm <laughs> smart Alex, I guess, you know, they're like, mom, but sorry, uh, my, nobody's gonna, you know, they're too far or this is too expensive. They're not gonna eat this stuff. So why are you bugging me, right? Okay, and I thought about this. I was like, look, yes, the person, the food which is getting wasted on my plate, nobody's gonna eat that. It's going to waste, period. But the co environmental cost of that is something we share together, right? The cost of, the envir of this wasted food in terms of water 250 cubic kilometers of water, that's three times the size of Lake Geneva, is wasted every year. 1.4 billion hectares of land is used to produce this food, which is about 25% of the total arable land in the world. Third biggest emitter of CO2, greenhouse gases, after, India, uh, after China and US, or US and China. 3.3 billion tons. So we may not share that plate or that food, but this environmental cost is equal to everybody in, on the globe. So yes, there is a waste, and yes, there is a cost, and yes, we pay less, but we should, still shouldn't waste it because it's not about that food, it is about this environmental cost, okay? And in the developing countries, you ask, why do, they, why do people waste uh, there? you know, before the plate part? And the answer is that if you don't have access to markets, why would you invest in saving, cleaning, protecting, if you're not gonna make anything on it, all right? So if there was a market for that, those commodities, people will behave differently than they behave today. So you combine the two, See, same amount of waste, both in, develop, both in developing, cost is the environmental cost. 
So we, we, what, do we, what did we decide here? We decided, yes, we produce enough. In fact, we produce enough that we can feed 9 billion people today if we do it in the right way. So it's not a, it's not a production problem. Second one, economics. Every year, $3.5 trillion is wasted because of hunger, expenses related to hunger and malnutrition in terms of productivity, as well as taking care of people. Okay. That comes to about $500 per person in terms of lost productivity per on the globe. And that comes to about 10% of your annual income. That's the, the cost of food waste, the one we just talked about, $750 billion per year. Okay. The last one is, okay, so what is the cost of ending this hunger? And uh, last year, IFA, WFP, FAO, and others, we did a study to find out, okay, if we were to get to uh, zero hunger in 2030, in terms of money, what would it take? And the answer was 270 billion per year for the next 15 years. That is 8% of this, that's it. So economically, at least in the global sense, you have a big advantage of solving the hunger problem. I'm, you guys are familiar with this, right? The, the Sustainable Development Goals, Goal Two of the of the which is about about zero hunger. And so, what will it take to get to zero hunger? That would take leaving no one behind. And what's funny here is, and this is why I put it in this way. In most cases, the this 767 million. That's the poorest people in the world. This, these are the people who make less than $1.90 per day, according to, uh, on PPP, Purchasing Power Parity, according to the World Bank. 670 million. 795 million, these are the people who are always hungry, chronically hungry. And 663 million who are, who have no access to clean drinking water, right? I would submit to you that in most cases we are talking about the same people here. Those who are poor also don't have <laughs> anything to eat and they don't have clean w drinking water, right? So if you're talking about getting to extreme, you know, no poverty, if you're talking about getting to zero hunger, you gotta work leaving no one behind. And it's extremely difficult, you know why? Because uh, how many math people here? Okay, if you, all right, all right, all right. You know, have, have you heard of the normal distribution, right? What we understand is the middle part of their distribution. We never understand the tails of those distributions, right? These guys, this is the tail of their distribution, right? And for us to understand that, you guys are technology buffs, right? That's where the technology comes in. We have to look better, we have to look deeper, and we have to look consistently and on a higher frequency to see what's going on with these guys. Okay, that's, that's a necessary condition of doing everything else which we need to do, and we're gonna get into that. First of all, we have to recognize that hunger is not a one-off. Right? If I had to feed everybody, if we had to feed everybody on the globe, all these hungry people, for one day, it would cost you less than two billion. But the point is not feeding them for one day. The point is we have to get them to a state where we don't have to feed them, they can feed themselves, right? And that means that this whatever solution we are gonna create, it has to be a local solution. So governments must be in the center. The political will is extremely important. And in a, uh, uh, in a way you could, this is very tricky, you know why? Because in any place, uh, if you're in power, 
if you're in if you're uh, ruling most people would like investments um, with uh, short investments with quick returns in terms of time right because you want to get reelected so if you say okay I'm going to invest all your money today and then I don't know when the return is coming on that you're not going to stay in office for too long with that right so what do people do they do short investment short return here what we need is quick investments in the hopes of longer returns better returns places which have done that they have succeeded china china poverty not too many years ago was in the 60s now we are in teens rwanda so where there is there is this political commitment you see different results in a way it is about you could say that it is about investing in the success of your successor so you invest somebody else benefits from it and that's 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 one thing second thing you cannot do it for one day and say oh this will help no you got to go day by day till you get there that's the sustained commitment part that is at the local level at the government level at the the regional level at the international level money same story and we all must work in a coordinated way and it shouldn't whether you call it development whether you call it emergency whether you call it something else you have to realize that you're talking about the same people so no matter which term you want to use your response must be coordinated and if you do these four things you will end up investing in saving and changing lives of people no surprise rural populations 40 plus almost 50% it's the women all right so you must invest in in empowering women child development no different in those places it matters here education it matters here these are the two things which i want to focus on you know if we are able to put money in the grassroots right and in a sustainable way that generates economic activity um jobs um in fact that generates demand which generates jobs to which then private sector can respond to which even they can force the public sector to come and do the infrastructure but it all happens only if there is a sustained demand right even in this country right when there is a there is a, a recession people get money back on their taxes right tax rebates and those rebates are given to people in the lowest uh, tax bracket because the idea is that they won't save that money but in fact they would spend that money and when they spend that money that is supposed to over a few years generate enough economic activity that a country comes out of a recession i mean that's that's the model here that's the model in many places right the same applies in africa and rural communities if we can put in enough resources that there is sustained growth there is sustained demand from those places private sector will respond and it won't only be the local private sector it will be a global private sector which will come to to fill, fill that demand without that it's only handouts right nobody is responding to handouts because it is not worth the investment if you don't have sustained demand why would somebody invest to come to you each and every year and i think that's that's really uh really important on the rural infrastructure uh if you build roads and we see this and we build roads because we need to move food from point a to point b right if you build roads it creates economic activity we build roads to move food but the same road is used for people to walk new markets open up uh distance to health centers shrinks and all of those things happen and suddenly you see that the places are uh, started to start to boom and that is why why that is so important is that now right now what you are seeing is that the life in some of the rural areas is so bad that the youth they migrate not because they would love to go to some place but they migrate because 
it is out of destitution. So you see people showing up in slums in Kenya, for example, or in Philippines, for example. And if we want to resolve that, we have to bring the cities, the, the facilities of the cities to rural areas. So people migrate, but they migrate for the right reason like I did and, I, and, and many of us did and came for better life. There's nothing wrong with that, but the reason matters. I didn't leave because I had a bad life. I left because I wanted better education. Most of the people we talk about, the, the stories you hear in Europe, those people are not leaving because they, they want a better life or, 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 or they're leaving because they're getting killed or they cannot make their ends meet. This is why they're leaving. And I think this is, this is something which is uh, really important. So here, I showed you all of this, and I haven't said much about technology. Because of very simple reason that first, you have to understand the problem which you're trying to address. On the famine side, acute short term, as well as the long term. But in order to do this, you must depend, rely on the best technologies which we have in terms of getting access to all the information that you need. I will now, in my, my, my role as the, as, the, as the head of food security, you know, we, we have uh, 200 people who are around the world, uh, food security analysts who go, and their day job is to see how the, how the situation is in, in, in different countries, right? And uh, they ask whenever there is a shock, they ask some very basic questions like what happened, how many people were affected, uh, what type of assistance would they require, for how long. That's simple, simple stuff, right? These questions have remained the same from centuries, right? Anytime something would happen, you would go and ask the same questions. So what has changed? What has changed is our ability to get that information out quickly, at a higher uh, frequency, at a cheaper cost, so we can design better operations, right? And we are investing with, uh, with uh, the likes of Facebook, Google, Cisco, Instead, Nielsen, Reuters, to improve our ability to get this information cheaply, quickly and from places which are hardly, which are inaccessible because maybe it is Ebola or it is conflict. From Yemen every month we get information on people's food security situation on a regular basis, every month. This was not possible many years ago. Using high resolution satellite imagery you can see what is happening on the ground. Are the camps shrinking or becoming bigger? What type of facilities are there? Because all of these questions at the bottom line is help us design a better response. So imagine that uh, you thought there were 50,000 people in a place. How you prepare for that versus if there were 25,000. And now with technology what we can do is we can see all of that. This is why it is important. When there is a conflict, things change very, very fast, right? So if you go in and you take six weeks to find out what is happening with the people's life, by the time you issue your report, things have changed, guys, right? So that frequency, that quickly asking few important things but asking at much, much higher frequency matters. And when there is, uh, I will give you another example of CDR, call detail records. Now we can, we can use uh, social media and, and CDR type of technologies to see when there is, let's say, a drought, hit, uh, sorry, uh, uh, earthquake hits, how people move and where do they go, right? Because if we know very, very quickly where they are going, we can have much efficient response, right? And we also can use the same technologies to know when they are coming back. So the investments in bots, where not only what 
we ask, but people can also tell them what's on their mind and tell them in their own time. Or we can bring them uh, uh, things like, you know, the harvest season, the prices of food commodities, of, their, of what they are selling. Huge impact, guys. And this is why we, we come here, we come to you as, 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 uh, as uh, technology people, as people who are interested in this, one, to understand why you are doing this, and two, yeah, we are doing it, but we can do better. Can you help us? Right? Are there better ways? Are you thinking? Because you, you, you guys are dealing with this all the time as well, right? So that is the purpose of, of, of this, this talk. And I'm, I will just, I like this thing which kind of stuck in my mind. I mean, it was uh, Nelson Mandela. He said many, many great things. Huh? So one thing he said um, was that it's, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I think for us, this zero hunger, it is all just like that. It seems really impossible but we can do it. Thank you very much.